John W. Brown is the CEO of Silent Falcon UAS Technologies, and he's located down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He, his company is a spinoff of Bi Aerospace and recently announced that they were beginning production of a UAV aircraft called the Silent Falcon. Uh, and what's interesting about this is, unlike many other of the aircraft of this type, this is entirely solar powered. So, obviously, it's something that we want to talk about. Now, John, welcome to EV World, first of all. Thank you. I am going from one end of the solar or one end of the electric vehicle to the spectrum. Okay. I just posted an article of an interview that I just did with the guys that build the battery systems for uh -huh. for uh, a scan line, or they will be building more for scan line or yes, yeah, scan lines, uh, passenger ferries. So these are the world's largest hybrid electric vehicles. <laughs> They have a battery pack of 2.7 megawatts. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a little bigger than ours. That's a little bigger than yours. So at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the Silent Falcon. So my first question to you is, UAVs, I understand what that acronym means. What is a UAS? Well, that's um, uh, the one interesting thing about this industry is they haven't figured out what to call themselves. <laughs> they, they don't like the word drones. Right. UAV is an acronym for unmanned uh, air, aerial or aircraft vehicle, and UAS is an unmanned aerial system. System, and, okay. Yeah, there's a big distinction there because the system includes lots of things besides the actual airframe and aircraft platform. Okay, so that, well, I would assume, would involve... Uh, the payload that it might be carrying. We'll talk about that a little bit later, sure. uh, as well as the various control systems. Probably the the control system, the uh, onboard flight computer, the flight controls, the communication system, and obviously the payload, and then all the software and everything that runs that. Right. Okay. Very good. Now, when I interviewed uh, George By, um, boy, it's been several years ago now, he was working on his electric Cessna 172 Skyhawk program. Um, haven't talked to him, of course, since then, but in the interim, he launched this UAV division, which then ultimately became Silent Falcon, as I understand it. So sort of connect the dots from, for us, if you will, from, from George's initial efforts to where you guys are today. Sure. Um, by aerospace, the, the way I like to characterize it, it's, it's, it's sort of an aerospace think tank. And they've got a lot of clever engineers and scientific and technical people who, among other things, uh, uh, spent a fair amount of time thinking about how to bring different kind of alternative energy technologies to aviation generally. And, and, and one of the results of that was the electric uh, Cessna project. But another one was um, uh, they actually was, was what they could do with uh, an electric-powered UAV. You, they, those have been around for a while. I mean, the Raven and the Puma, which are made by Aero Environment, are kind of ubiquitous in the military world. Yep. But they have um, they have uh, uh, pretty limited endurance. The Raven may be 45 minutes of practical time, and the Puma maybe an hour and a half, maybe a little bit longer. But the question was whether or not you could take alternative energy technologies and specifically uh, uh, thin film photovoltaics, which are lightweight, Right. And put put them on an airplane wing and figure, and get an extended endurance out of that, and it worked best on lighter lighter aircraft platforms of which a UAV is one. So they they started fiddling around with that, and lo and behold, they figured out it, it would work. And then and, and I, I was involved with the company at the time I was on the Bi Aerospace's board, um, and um, then they like all good. Uh, technical people, they said, hey, we've invented this cool thing, now is there a market for it? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this was back in 2010, and at that point in time, really the only market for UAVs was, was the military and, yeah. and intelligence and defense markets, are starting to be around the world. And so we went to folks that flew these things, and we said, hey, um, what, what would you like that you don't have? And they said, we'd like really long endurance, we'd like we like really sophisticated data and imagery. Um, we like it to be easy, and we like it to be inexpensive. Right. And said, okay, well, we can we can do all of that. We and so, can give you three of the four. Take your pick, right? Or all right. four. <laughs> and, and well, we you know we were crazy enough to think that we could do that, and lo and behold, 
Uh, we did, so we formed the company as a sheet of paper at the end of 2010. It didn't really get active involved, actively involved uh, doing things in until middle of 2011, which is when I got conned into taking over the leadership of it. But uh, we quickly be it be quickly became apparent to us that although UAVs had been really well proven in military applications, there really wasn't um, a lot of uh, technology that had been brought to them since the one the military ones were developed in the late 90s and early 2000s. And so, as our first step on that, we actually ended up developing our own sensor package, which is our Falcon Vision payload. And so, we, we took the latest technology available and built an incredible um, high-definition electro-optical infrared sensor. Um, and that, that's what put us in the, in, the, in the part of the game that said they want really incredible data and imagery. And so... Um, so we spent most of uh, 2012 uh, developing, uh, fine-tuning the, the aircraft, the airframe, the solar power system, the sensor package, and we thought we had something pretty cool, and we unveiled it at the industry trade show, AUVSI, in August of 2012, and lo and behold, a whole bunch of folks came up to us and said, you know, we think there's going to be a market for things other than military, which is the, what they called at the time, or what we called at the time, the public safety market. Right. Law enforcement, border patrol, drug interdiction, forest service, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, and a funny thing happened. For most of the missions that they wanted to do, they needed something that would stay up in the air all day long. They needed incredible imagery and data. They needed it to be kind of really simple to operate, and they needed it to be relatively inexpensive. So we, we kind of lucked into uh, having a system that not only fit uh, the attributes of certain defense markets, but it seemed like we were positioned really well for the public safety agency market. And so we, um, we finished up 2012 um, uh, uh, finalizing things, starting to shift into what I would call demonstration or pre-production systems. And, um, and, and then last year, uh, uh, an interesting thing happened. A couple of uh, a couple of our, our early shareholders who had been experts and for some time had been selling things like remote sensing, imaging, geodesic, geomatic services, mapping services and products uh, in primarily in uh, the Asia Pacific region and Latin America they came to us and said you know our customers really want a UAV platform to do these kinds of sensors and stuff. But what they need is something that can stay up all day because they don't want to have to bring it back every hour, hour and a half. They want the ability to, to provide incredible imagery and data. They want it to be simple to operate and low cost. And so again, we kind of lucked into where we think the biggest market for these things is now today. Unfortunately, it's not going to be in the U.S. for a couple of years because of the, the FAA has some really serious issues in terms of uh, figuring out how to integrate these things into national airspace. But overseas, um, for what we call the commercial and, and civil markets, uh, if we were producing enough right now, we would be selling them right now. And, uh, and, the, and the applications for them and the uses of them have just exploded. It run the gam they run the gamut from counting wildlife to precision agriculture to doing mining uh, surveys, environmental surveys, to protecting infrastructure, to detecting leaks and pipelines, to uh, it, there's just a whole host of applications and uh, what emerging vertical markets that 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 is where the action is right now. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about a little bit about the the performance capabilities here. Then you yeah. say all day. Uh, and looking at the website, I think I saw a reference to what's the six to eight hours, something like that. Obviously, since it's solar powered, it's going to be up there when the sun's shining. Right. Essentially, although you may have you know a window of battery reserve on on either side of that, and that uh, well, actually probably... we're we're um, sort of like the way uh, Tesla um, is is a combination. We actually what our solar um, capabilities do. The analogy that I use is it fills the gas tank while we fly. Okay. And so, and so that. Um, uh, uh, the, what it really does is it, is it dramatically extends the range of what would otherwise be a purely electrical-powered 
uh, aircraft. And so we have a 488 watt hour battery on it, which is our main propulsion battery. Okay. And in our medium wing con configuration, we generate a little over 80 watts of uh, power on average. And what that does is it drops our power consumption back considerably, our net power consumption back considerably, so that we extend our range on that particular configuration to eight plus hours. Yeah, so let's talk about airspeed and, and altitude and some of those kind of issues. What typically would this be operating at? And, and what is the the range? And obviously, the range is going to somewhat be dictated whether or not this thing is being manually controlled by a ground operator and staying within radio range or satellite link, uh, as opposed to sending something that's autonomous. And you tell right. it go here to a GPS coordinate, do something, and come back. The um, uh, the range. Well, uh, let's talk about speeds first. Um, we designed the system. Both the, both the aerodynamic design of the airframe and the combination of motor and propeller technology to optimize um, endurance. Okay. And so uh, we have a sweet spot for what we call loiter speed or mission speed, which is a little over 20 knots, okay. where everything is at its most efficient. If you, it, can, it can go a lot faster. Uh, and if you, but it, it, the curves for the power consumption are such that, you know, it, 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 it does pretty significantly reduce your endurance if you want to, if you want to fly at 40 or 50 knots, which you can do. It's just that it, it uh, the physics of it requires a, a lot more power. So right. our, our system was optimized for the applications that we're trying to sell it into, which is, um, where you need persistent, uh, uh, endurance. You need to stay up for a long period of time and cover a fair amount of area. Whether you're doing that area in a grid pattern uh, or in a figure eight pattern or going point to point, um, where our, our range, if you were to calculate it out, um, is, uh, is something less than if we were to just put it on a autonomous flight and let it fly, it's something less than 300 kilometers, maybe okay. 260. Um, but that's not really how you would operate it. Right. Uh, yeah. Could it the the real limitation on the range is on the communication links. It is not it is not controlled or, or communicated with via satellite. It's communicated via RF. Right. And okay. So limited to uh, to two things: uh, line of sight, and then also the capability of the the the, the distance of your of your radio link. We with very specialized tracking and expensive tracking antennas, uh, you can get using one radio configuration in theory up to 100 miles. But from a practical standpoint, the practical, probably the most practical range limitation is about 50 miles. Yeah. And that's, that, that's, for, uh, that's using a, a, a relatively standard comm link and a directional antenna on the ground. If you're a radio guy, you would understand that. Yeah. So, um, so what uh, which is which is actually pretty pretty significant compared to other systems, and so so for you know if you're gonna if you're going to uh, overfly a forest fire to give to give situational awareness to the firefighters, that's that's fine. If you're going to be doing mining surveys, that's fine. Um, if you're going to be if you're going to be monitoring pipelines, you can put your your ground control stations at at various lengths and and go kind of point to point and, and do it that way. So uh, that's 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 that is basically the you know the range is really limited by the by the line of sight of the of the radio links and you can as I said you can extend it pretty far but uh, you have to have pretty good conditions to do that. Okay, so sort of brings up a question then regarding the business model here. I'm guessing that what you're anticipating here is that you guys manufacture them, you sell them, you provide some support services if there needs upgrades or somebody crashes one and they need to have it repaired, things of that nature, uh, as opposed to manufacturing and then perhaps leasing them to, to organizations that will use them for a short profile of time and then they come back to you and then you lease them to somebody else. Could you sort of talk a little about that? Sure. I mean, um, for all you read about drones and so forth in the newspapers and on 60 Minutes and all that stuff, the reality is, is the industry does not exist today other than for military and, and defense applications. It is coming on like 
is starting to exist and it is coming on like gangbusters. And I don't think that there's any question in anyone's mind that it's going to be enormous on a global basis. But the newness of it uh, is such that there, there really aren't a lot of the established kind of uh, business models like, like you're talking about. Having said that, we've responded to RFPs for things like monitoring electrical grids in countries where we would set up a business in that country that would buy our systems and then provide the monitoring of the electrical grid. And I, and I expect that what we call the power by the hour business model will become, um, will become important. There are a couple of companies already that, have, that are set up to do services like that, one in, uh, 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 not in the U.S. because the market doesn't really exist here, but in Colombia and Australia and uh, 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 there's a handful of folks that are right. see that coming and they, they want to buy systems so that they can provide the service. At the end of the day, what, what the customer cares about is the data and the imagery that they're getting. Okay. And so if it's less expensive and it's better, they really like that. And, and so what we're finding is that a lot of uh, applications where people use fixed-wing aircraft or helicopters, they're coming to us and saying, can you do this with the, with the UAV? And the UAV, for many, not all of these applications, is a superior platform for doing that. We can fly low and slow, which yeah. gives you much better data. Um, uh, and and we're, we're, you know, a solar electric powered airplane has one moving part, which is the motor. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the maintenance costs and the fuel costs are insignificant oh. at the operator yeah. cost for a fraction. Compared, compared pilot. to a helicopter, oh my God, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there there are there are applications where a helicopter and fixed wing aircraft is better, but there are many where where the UAV is, um, is, is the preferred platform. An interesting thing is that a UAV's natural limitations are the size, the weight, and the power uh, of, the pl of the payloads that they carry. And one of the things that we've discovered is that by generating power on board through our solar panels, um, we can trade off endurance for carrying uh, power-hungry payloads. For example, there is a LiDAR unit that uh, requires 60 watts of power, and so we, and it, and it, it's, I, we think with the shoehorn and a lot of grease, we can fit it into yeah. our eyes. Okay, so for people who aren't familiar with the term LIDAR, that refers to what? That is a uh, technology that uses um, a laser uh, imaging uh, to very precisely, down to the Nats eyeball, measure things on the ground, and it's used for Mining surveys, for okay. mapping surveys, for a, a whole host of uh, a whole host of applications. Okay. And uh, uh, and so in that particular instance, um, you know, the we can because we generate power on board, it does it does diminish our endurance, and it's a relatively heavy he heavy payload. But um, uh, our uh, it, we can perform that we can perform that mission because we have this power generating capability. Right, got it. Okay, which which question brings up a question. Some UAV aircraft have gone with, if you will, the quadricopter uh -huh. approach. You obviously have taken the more fixed wing approach. I assume that's probably be again because of this very issue of endurance. There's no place to put large solar panels on a no. on a quadricopter as opposed to wings and empennage and tail surfaces. On That's a, true. Fixed-wing aircraft. That's true, but um, a, a different way to look at that is the way that we define the market. 